with me, Emma Kenny. I have a puppy in my arms. A lot of you ask about Dolly. And really, I just want any excuse to show off my absolutely gorgeous puppy. And that's not a euphemism for any of you start going on. She looks intently like she wants cuddles, but the truth is, she's spotted I've got a cup of tea. And any minute now, she'll want to jump off this chair and then she'll want to drink the dregs. But not even dregs. I end up having to leave her some of my cup of tea. Feels grossly unfair. There she goes. Anyway, if you're new to my channel and you're wondering what on earth is she talking about and why is there a puppy involved in a true crime video, I release crime content on a Wednesday and Sunday religiously. Catchphrases, if you like crime and you like consistency, I am your gal. It's as simple as that. Big shout out to everybody out there who is supporting me on Patreon. New podcast coming all the time. Really appreciate you. And to all of my YouTube membership, seeing your little green names pop up and also getting involved in Discord and seeing all the recommendations, which I am going to do. It's been great. It's kind of made me rethink some of my unwillingness to do bigger known crimes, which has led to me covering cases that are coming up that you've asked for. But also just because without your support, I wouldn't be able to make this content. And it's just so incredible that you come along and you watch and you get involved in my live premiere chats and just engage as a supportive community. So thank you so much. I've wanted to do today's case for a while. It's a new case. And the reason I wanted to do this was because it was one of those cases that was just utterly shocking. But it seemed to happen at a time where, shall we say, there were so many other things going on that even though what I'm going to talk about today is just truly terrifying, that these kind of things can happen to women in our communities, somehow it didn't feel like it got the press that it deserved. Take you back, for example, to Sarah Everard, a case that I've covered with Wayne Cousins, the murderer, horrible police officer who murdered that poor defenseless woman. But for some reason, this case, which is equally as harrowing, just didn't get the level of coverage that I think it deserved. And so I followed this case closely because I wanted to know the outcome. Also, the most important part was I wanted to know that somebody got apprehended for it because initially it was very, very challenging to figure out who had carried out this seemingly random killing. So today I'm going to talk about a man called Kochi Selimaj. And Kochi Selimaj is one of those truly heinous human beings with certain serial killer intention, stroke capacity and capability, who probably, if he hadn't been apprehended, would indeed be killing women right now. Like I said, this is gonna be one of those cases that is shocking to listen to. So who was he? Well, 36 year old Kochi Selimaj was originally from Albania. He was born in the Albanian city of Elbasan. He didn't have a great education, he left school at 12 and he had no qualifications to his name at all. That is clearly going to impact on your life choices and opportunities. One can't deny that. And it also gives us an indicator into potentially some of the issues that he faced in childhood. The fact that he didn't continue his education. Clearly we're talking about a different culture. Every culture has different expectations and norms, but certainly 12 seems very young to be leaving school with absolutely no qualifications and credentials to your name. His family then moved to neighboring Greece, and this is where Salamadji's parents returned to Albania. Now, when Salamadji's parents returned to Albania, so they returned to their homeland, it seems that Selimaj and his siblings remain in Greece. And the reason for that is that as far as they were concerned, there were better prospects there. Completely understand that, makes perfect sense. And even though his parents returned to their home country, understandably, the parents would be happy that their children were trying to create a more prosperous life for themselves. Then Selimaj comes to the UK. That's around seven years ago. and. I think that when you live in the UK, some of us take issue with the way things are run. Certainly the last few years have proven to be a challenge for us to process. But nonetheless, compared to a lot of places, the UK is a place where people want to come and live. It is still considered a land of opportunity in so many ways. And with respect, 
we have it easier than people do in lots and lots of countries. So again, I have complete empathy and sympathy with Stella Madge wanting to come to the UK looking for a better life. He'd been working as a pizza deliverer, so a pizza driver for Domino's Pizza. That was from 2021. It was the May 2021 that he'd kind of been working for them. But by the July, he'd quit. And whether he was just poor at having a consistent job, whether he thought it was beneath him, whether he was hoping for better opportunities, who knows? But in spite of the fact that he'd only started working in the May, he'd finished by the July. And then by September 2021, he's living in Eastbourne, East Sussex, which I think is a lovely part of the world for those of you who don't know. Just going to put this down for the dog. So he's moved around a little bit. He's now living in a seaside town. Eastbourne is very beautiful. It really is coastal and it's a mixed area. There's rich people, there's poor people, but it's very picturesque. So questions were asked as to whether he should even have been in the UK because he entered illegally in 2015. He was an individual who arrived on a lorry. So he wasn't meant to be in the UK. Then he manages to acquire some kind of income for a period of time. And then he based himself in Eastbourne. Again, he's working as a pizza delivery driver. He works as a garage attendant. But then he meets a Romanian woman and he actually marries her. So he marries his Romanian wife on the 5th of November, 2018. At this point, they're living in a flat and that flat is behind a row of shops in Eastbourne. So he's managed to connect and at this point commit to a woman and to some degree things would be looking up in this moment because he has a relationship and that will make it more possible for him to access certain things because if he's not legally here that could pose a problem and an issue for him in lots of different circumstances when he has a wife who is legally here because she was an EU citizen she had greater rights per se in the UK being here legally but also she had UK immigration rights and the UK launched a program that was called the EU settlement scheme that was in 2019. Those of you who know about what happened in the UK we were a part of Europe and then people made a decision to vote on whether we wanted to remain in Europe or not and the decision was that we were going to leave Europe. But that left a huge amount of European people who come from all over Europe, living in the UK, being really fearful about whether they were going to be in a position where they were allowed to stay. So this is how the government responded to that. The EU settlement scheme in 2019 basically gave all EU nationals and their spouses permission to remain in the UK after Brexit. So now we have Selimarge, who had been an illegal immigrant, giving permission through this channel to legally have the right to stay in the UK because of his marriage, despite the fact he entered illegally. Even though he's got this opportunity now, the marriage isn't going well. And by the summer of 2021, his marriage had broken down. It had broken down because of his behavior. It's only alleged because there were no criminal convictions at the time that he was violent in his marriage, but it will be confirmed later on down the line when I tell you about how this crime plays out. But certainly it seems that his wife left at this moment in time because she just knew that she was unsafe. He was a violent human being and she knew that their marriage was not one that was gonna have a positive outcome. And she moves out of their shared home now, at this point, that means that his right to stay in the UK was in jeopardy because that scheme is linked to the fact that you do have a spouse who is entitled to remain in the UK through that programme. And obviously, if they're getting divorced, that's going to be an issue. On Tuesday, the 14th of September 2001, Salamash does a really strange thing. Really strange. He books an expensive room at the five-star Grand Hotel in Eastbourne, which is really odd because he lives there, literally, minutes away, essentially. So why would he go and book a five-star hotel in his locality 
on that Friday night, it didn't make sense and doesn't make sense. So that particular evening, it was meant to be the 17th of September 2021, that he was going to stay over at the Grand Hotel. And like I said, it's very odd behaviour because he lives nearby, he's not a rich guy, why would you want to spend money, stroke waste money even, on an expensive hotel room? In hindsight, looking back at what plays out on the night of the crime that we're going to talk about today, it feels as if he had a sexual motive. It was, he was booking that particular suite, that room, because what he wanted to do was spend time with somebody and engage in sexual intercourse or sexual activity of some sorts. And that makes sense because why else would you book a room in a nice hotel that is so local to you? I'm all for a nice hotel break, don't get to go on them very often, but obviously I'm probably gonna make sure that the boundary is at least an hour away to make it feel like I'm going on a little jaunt, but he doesn't. On that very same evening that Salamaj has booked the hotel, we have 28-year-old Sabina Nessa. She is simply getting ready. She is getting herself dolled up, making herself look lovely because she's gonna go meet a friend at the depot bar. It's in Pegler Square. This was literally a short walk from a home on Astle Road in Kidbrook, southeast London. The walk itself takes around five minutes, so very close to home. But the route that she takes would take her through Cater Park. Now, Cater Park, I've looked it up, it is a gorgeous, picturesque green space. It's actually won awards, it's won awards for placemaking, biodiversity and landscaping because it is really well thought out, it's gorgeous. Now Sabina had really gone out of her way to make herself look lovely, she's very beautiful. She was looking forward to just enjoying the weekend because she's had a really long week at work. So it was an opportunity for her to relax and unwind and hang out with friends and make herself look beautiful. At 8.27pm, she sends a WhatsApp message to her friend and then she sets off from her home. This is about five minutes after sending that message. So she knows exactly where she's going, what she's doing, and this is an area that she knows very, very well. It's minutes from her home. Sabina, as a human being, it was hard to pull out the comments I'm going to make tonight because there were so many to choose from, genuinely. I have very rarely found so many people talking about what an incredible human being this woman was. Apart from the fact that she was a much-loved daughter, of course, she was a much-loved aunt, sister, she was also very well-loved in the community, she was a primary school teacher. Sabina taught a year one class at Rushy Green Primary School in Catford and she'd worked there from July 2020. She was said to be a truly talented teacher. She was somebody who was very popular with her pupils. And I think for the mass majority of us, we can always remember that one teacher who just stands out. They noticed us in the right places and spaces. They reminded us of our worth when we were struggling. They saw a talent that very few others noticed. They just made us feel validated. She was that kind of teacher. A head teacher described her as kind, caring, and absolutely dedicated to her pupils. One of the things that she had a dream of doing, in fact, was to go and teach in the Middle East one day. So she had big plans. Her family described her as an absolute role model, an amazing role model, in fact. That she was an individual who was always willing to defy the norms. That she wanted to be strong and independent, she wanted to be powerful, she was fearless, she was bright. They described her as having an amazing soul, someone who was truly kind, someone who was open-minded, accepting, and that constantly was smiling. She was somebody who was dedicated to helping others. So, like I said, there were a million things I could have talked to you about regarding the descriptions of Sabina, but all of them follow that kind of context. Her parents were Abda Ruf and Aziban Nessa, and they were, and are, rightly proud of their daughter. She was somebody that had not given them any hard work growing up, 
and had succeeded. She had dreams that she was going to fulfill and nobody had any doubt of her capacity to do that. Also, Sabina was really close to her older sister, Jabina, and Jabina said that Sabina was amazing. She was caring, she was absolutely beautiful. I think it's clear from what I've talked about that that has been agreed on by every single party who describes this young woman. Now, earlier that same evening, Selamaj has travelled to London. This is from his home in Eastbourne, also where he's booked that hotel room in Eastbourne for that evening. Eastbourne's on the south coast of England, by the way, so it is possible to travel to London and back in that kind of time frame. Now, before making his journey, he'd actually gone and checked in to the Grand Hotel. He checked in around 2.20 p.m., but he caused a scene to such a degree that the staff were concerned about firstly his conduct and also why he was there. They called the police on 101 because they felt like his demeanour and the fact that he was being really argumentative just didn't make them feel comfortable. But also, one of the big provokers of their reaction was he lived so near to the hotel. So it didn't make sense to them. Why had he turned up in this kind of aggressive, agitated mood? But on top of that, his address is local. Now, no officer was sent to that scene, but when they investigated how that situation had been handled, they did establish that the call handler had dealt with the matter correctly. So that wasn't a failure, or shall we say a contributing factor into the crime I'm gonna talk about today and some of the failures that could have occurred. Then Selimaj contacts his estranged wife, that's later on the same afternoon. His wife was 45 year old Yonella Gergeson. I don't know whether I've pronounced that correctly, but I think I have. So Yonella obviously had been married to him, there'd been violence in the relationship, she'd escaped, but she's still really afraid of him. She knows that he's got past form, she knows he's very abusive, in fact, before they split up, he had choked her on numerous occasions. So she's going to be really fearful. And the thing about fear is, on one level, you could say, well, just don't meet him. But a lot of people who've been in abusive relationships, they just want to make sure they maintain the status quo. They want to make sure it's peaceful. So it doesn't surprise me that Yanella decides that she is going to meet him because she likely won't want to get into a scenario where she's created conflict with him, which could have some dire consequences for her, which she has experienced in the past being choked out by him and it being so serious in the long term that she had left the relationship because it was becoming dangerous. So he asks her to meet him in the car park of the Grand Hotel. She works there. She's actually a cleaner. So again, why has he booked that room? What's going on in his mind? What does he think that he can create in that situation? And Yanella said when he met her, he was in a very agitated state. And as we kind of made assumptions about, and I'm sure a lot of you have, it seems like he was attempting to engineer sex with her and he actually even tries to come on to her to get her into the back seat so that they can have sex together. She sensibly and rightfully refuses and they're in a situation where she needs to go back to work anyway. So Yunella returns to work and Selimaj leaves. But I guess we can assume that he was in a sexually frustrated state by this point. You know, he's had his advances spurned and also, he may be feeling angry now because a woman that he used to control is no longer allowing him to control her. A woman that he once felt he possessed is rejecting that he has ownership over her. And that could have made him very, very angry on top of the fact that we're already seeing this agitated behavior. And of course, the fact that he's booked the room and we can only equate that to him wanting to have some kind of sexual encounter. So is it at this moment when he gets rejected by his wife, although estranged, that he makes a decision that at some point he is going to have sex with somebody? Salamaj then starts driving to Brighton and it, he just drives around. It's clear 
when I talk to you about this crime, when you reflect on what was going on within his mind whilst he's driving around, that it wasn't innocent. This isn't somebody who's trying to clear the head. It isn't somebody who's just looking around a locality and being interested because Brighton is a cool and interesting place to go. No, he's not doing any of those things. He's looking for a victim. As far as I'm concerned, he was absolutely 100% planning to have sex that night, whether it was consensual or not. And driving around Brighton, he's scoping out who could be his victim. But for whatever reason, it feels like he was unable to identify somebody that was suitable. For any of you who've been to Brighton, it's a busy place, it's a bustling place, it's a beautiful place. It'd be quite difficult to procure a victim, particularly one that is non-consensual in those circumstances. And it may have well been that it was just too busy for him to think that he could find somebody available in that situation. So then he drives up to Kidbrook, and at this point, he does something really sinister. He goes to Sainsbury's and in Sainsbury's he buys some very questionable items. One of those items was a rolling pin. He was buying that as a weapon, without a doubt. That's how he planned to procure a victim, to overpower a victim, to render them helpless and incapable of fighting back. So at this point, without a doubt, I feel it confirms that he was looking for somebody to rape or to sexually violate. And he's just thinking about the best way that he can do that using the items that are available to him in that moment. He also buys chili flakes and he buys an energy drink. The energy drink, again, it adds to that agitation, doesn't it? So you can see that he thinks that potentially he's in for a long night and he's willing to do what it takes to make sure that he assumes and essentially achieves whatever it is that he wants to achieve, which is a murderous intention without doubt. Seems like at some point, even though he's got the rolling pin, which without doubt he's bought as a weapon, he decides that it isn't going to be effective enough. So instead, he parks his car in Pegler Square. Bear in mind what I mentioned before about where Sabina was due to meet her friend at the bar. So they're now in the same area. At this point, Selmaj retrieves a two-foot emergency metal breakdown triangle from the boot of his car. A lot of you will drive around with those. You know, if you're in a situation where you've broken down, it lets people know that there's a hazard there. It's the kind that you can unfold and put down on the road, particularly if you break down at night so that other vehicles don't hit you. But they're heavy, and it was certainly heavier than a rolling pin. And it seems that in this moment, he decides that's going to be a far more effective weapon. So we're at a point now where we can see premeditation, can't we? Because he's bought a rolling pin. He's had the wherewithal to consider whether it's going to be useful. And now he's actually taken what he would consider a more appropriate weapon that he can use on a victim out of his car. He's had time to think about this. He's had time to think this is a ridiculous idea. What am I doing? He's had a moment to regroup reframe, forget that stupid plan, but no. If anything, it spurred him on that he's got this other weapon that seems more purposeful and useful. And then he enters Cater Park. It's around 8 p.m. And he's loitering around. His hood's pulled up. You can clearly see he's just waiting for a suitable victim. All he is driven by in this moment, I believe, is this violent sexual encounter that is planned. And tragically, for Sabina, she's going about her business. She's just got herself ready after a good but hard week at work. She's going to go and see a friend. She just needs to get to the bar safely. And all that happens is she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like nothing could have prepared her when she was doing her makeup, when she was just connecting with that. <sighs> Freedom, Friday, go out, hang out with my friend. Nothing could have run through her mind that this would be her final moments. But shortly after 8.30 p.m., Selimaj sees her, this really attractive young woman. She's alone. Because of that, she's vulnerable. And he just hones in. He hones in on her as a target. 
One of the things that I discovered about Sabina that kind of made me feel really sad is that she'd actually apparently spoken in the past about the concerns that she had about walking alone through Cater Park, especially at night, which makes perfect sense. It was something that provoked a reaction in her. There was an instinct within her that if somebody was going to hurt you, this would be a perfect place where they could conceal themselves so that they could then get you and get to you. And that is something that makes me go, oh, isn't it strange how people are equipped with this intuition? And even when we have it, because so often people tell us that we're silly for feeling that way. Oh, that would never happen. Don't be so ridiculous. You know, it happens all the time that you will have an instinct and then people will just squash that instinct. I remember having a row with somebody in one of my membership bodies because I dared to say that I felt that instinct and intuition was a big part of the therapeutic paradigm. And they were basically chastising me and saying, how dare I use, I don't know, the most primordial thing about being human, which is instinct. Not being weird, but that's why a mouse runs away from a cat. It doesn't hang around going, oh, that's a really nice, cute, big, furry thing. It's like, I don't know what that is. I think it might eat me. Instinct saves its life, right? But what about humans? Humans often have these feelings and then other people squash them. They're like, that will never happen. Sabina's felt that. She's felt that instinct, that intuition, but she's leveraged that it's safe. She shouldn't have to be concerned. She just needs to walk through that park because she's running late to meet a friend. So on that occasion, she decides to do so. And she should absolutely have been able to do so without being in fear at all. The park actually was the quickest route to get where she was going. Clearly, she didn't wanna let her friend down because that's the kind of person Sabina was. So again, She's thinking about her etiquette, turning up on time. But like I said, it always gets me when people have those feelings and fears and they don't act on them because often they're made to feel like they're just being somebody who's dramatic in thinking that something terrible could happen. And yet here she is, unbeknownst to her, those very fears about to come absolutely true in the most tragic and macabre and diabolical of ways that she could have ever imagined. She had no clue whatsoever as she walked through that park that there had been a man loitering there for about 20 minutes, just lurking in the shadows with sinister intent, just hanging out, waiting. CCTV footage actually captures the events that followed and they actually capture her being brutally attacked. So it's all captured on film. First of all, on the CCTV, you see a man and he's walking with his hood up and he's got that metal triangle in his hand. He crossed paths with Sabina and she actually glances to her right and after she passes, then he checks. He checks that no one's around, no one's watching. And then he turns and that's when he runs. He runs after the unsuspecting Sabina. She didn't have a chance. He ran up to her at speed from behind and then his arm with this metal triangle and he just launches this brutal frenzied attack on this completely helpless defenseless young woman he battered her 34 times with that two-foot metal weapon she was totally taken by surprise she had no idea that this was going to happen she's desperately trying to defend herself and while she's trying to defend herself as well she falls onto this bench and this relentless attack just carries on. She's got defense injuries on her right hand and it demonstrates that even though she would have been blindsided by this attack, completely stunned and shocked, that still she fought. She tried to fend off her attacker. He hit her so hard with that triangle that it broke into pieces. He renders her completely helpless. And then after the attack, he carries her. He carries Sabina completely unconscious over his shoulder up onto a bank and then he takes her into long grass in the darkness of the park. He remains there for about 20 minutes. The only time 
he actually reappears on camera was about after 10 minutes and at that point he collects the broken metal triangle. That's from near the bench where he discarded it when there was the kind of defence going on where she was trying to defend herself. And then he just returns to where he'd left Sabina. He stays there for another 10 minutes. Exactly what he did to Sabina during those 20 minutes, I'll be honest, we may never actually know for sure. Bear in mind, after a period of time, he went and collected that particular object that he'd done so much damage to her with. So he's thinking about his actions and he's thinking about the forensics, isn't he? So the very fact that he's doing that demonstrates that he's completely conscious of the crime he's committing. And he doesn't want to be linked to the crime either. So just because we don't have a lot of forensic detail at the scene, and we don't, I'll talk about that shortly, that doesn't mean things did not happen. It means that he was clever enough to conceal what happened. What they believe played out is that he put Sabina in an arm lock around her neck and then he asphyxiated her for around half a minute. Bear in mind she was already terribly injured by blunt force trauma that I've described. Then he removes her tights and her underwear, but to get her tights and her underwear off, what he needs to do is actually take her boots off first. So he removes the boots, but then he puts them back on her after he's removed her tights and underwear. Then he lifts her clothes to expose her mid to lower part of her body. And then he also lifts up her top, so he exposes her bra. Before he leaves her, he actually poses her. So he walked away from that horrific crime scene, leaving her legs apart, and he placed her hands in the pockets of a jacket, and then he attempted to cover her body with leaves and grass. He also removed her tights and underwear from the crime scene completely. They've never been recovered. Then, he used wet wipes to wipe down the bench that he'd attacked her on before he leaves. So, again, it just gives you some insight into the preparation and the mindset of this monster. He's really thought about this. This is calculated. He knows what he needs to do to try to avoid arrest. It really doesn't take long for Sabina's body to be found. She's found by a dog walker at 5 p.m. the following day. That's near the Open Space Community Centre in Cater Park. She's covered in leaves. She's just 200 yards from the safety of a family home, which is just absolutely breathtakingly sad. 200 yards from the safety of a family home. They establish through the post-mortem the extent of her injuries and they're able to very quickly see the brutality of the attack that she was subjected to. She had significant blunt force trauma injuries to her head. She'd suffered broken ribs. Her liver was almost damaged. So you can imagine the kind of impact we're talking about when the liver is damaged. And the pathologist also concluded that it was either head injuries or asphyxiation that could have actually caused her death. Also, investigators were absolutely convinced, as I am, as I'm sure all of you are, that there was most definitely a sexual element to the attack. There was no physical evidence that was pointing to this, so there was no presence of bodily fluids. There were no injuries to the genitalia. However, the fact that the underwear had been removed that the outer clothes were lifted to expose Sabina's flesh, the fact that her body had been posed provocatively, also the fact that he took the time that he took with her, that suggests there was definitely a sexual motive to murder. And I think that the suggestion they've made about him removing the underwear because there potentially was DNA evidence is very likely. Of course, we can also say he would want to take the underwear as a trophy. Yes, that's absolutely possible but if he had left certain incriminating evidence he may have felt that the underwear would lead the police to him and like I said it would be bizarre to not suggest that this is absolutely linked to a sexual assault 
because everything that I'm telling you in this really sad tale points to it. Now that Selimaj has carried out this horrific crime, he heads back to Eastbourne and on his way back, he dumps the murder weapon, the metal triangle, in the River Tees, which is to the south of Tunbridge Wells. Then he continues to Eastbourne. He arrives at the Grand Hotel just after midnight. And CCTV literally shows him just striding through the lobby. It's not like he's trying to look small or hide himself. It certainly doesn't seem like a man without confidence. Quite the contrary, in fact. The murder investigation after Sabina's body is found is launched, of course. And although the attack had been caught on film, so they literally had the entire attack played out in front of them, the police had no idea of the perpetrator's identity. The reason for this is because he'd pulled his hood up. Also, there was no forensic evidence left at the scene. So the investigation is at a point where they are frustrated because they can literally see this poor, defenseless, innocent woman being brutally slain and they can see the individual who has done it, but there's not enough evidence in those pictures to point out who it is. So that's when the police just start trawling through hundreds of hours of CCTV because they know that if they can find somebody who looks like that and fits that description near the area, then they may be able to trace that person back and find out who they are. And the break arrives because after they're going through these hundreds of hours of CCTV, they see this figure leaving the park and they notice this figure is carrying some kind of fluorescent object. It's glinting. And this, of course, we know is the murder weapon, it's the metal triangle. So from this, they're able to initially establish at least the potential suspect's direction of travel. So then, in figuring out which way he traveled, they know a balding man wearing gray jeans and a black jacket who's caught on CCTV. And again, they notice that he's holding something in his hands. And they also notice he's looking over his shoulder and he keeps pulling his hood up as he walks along the pavement. So even his movements look sketchy. It's enough to invite the attention of the officers investigating. They can see that he doesn't look like somebody who's acting in an innocent way. He looks concerned that somebody might be following him or somebody might have noticed him and he's acting in that way. Now he appears to be the same man that had earlier been seen entering Cater Park. So then the investigators are able to identify the same man before that so they find again on CCTV a man who matches this description driving a vehicle into Pegler Square. They're able to see that he arrived in Kidbrook at 7.41pm. Now bear in mind the CCTV of the vehicle, even though they've got this guy that they're kind of connecting, the vehicle itself is quite blurry. So even though they're like, this is the same guy, they can't make out the registration. But they are able to conclude that it's either a silver or a beige Nissan Micra. And they actually go to Nissan specialists and they speak to them in London and they confirm that that is indeed a silver or a beige Nissan Micra. So at this point, through the help of those specialists in London, they're actually able to narrow down the year and the type of the vehicle. Which is amazing, isn't it? that they're actually going into this detail to ensure that they figure out who this violent perpetrator is. Now, unfortunately, as they're trying to kind of figure out who owns this car, the nearest ANPR camera, which is the one that takes number plates en route to Cater Park, was actually broken. This means that the officers then have to look at every single vehicle that fits the description within a two mile radius of the crime scene. That involved, in fact, more than 60 Nissan Micras. But they have to go ahead and they have to eliminate every single one of those cars to make sure that they find their man. Investigators know that tracing the individual on CCTV is gonna be a major foundation in solving this case, in solving this investigation. They start making public appeals. They're releasing this man's image. They're releasing details of his car. And investigators ultimately discover that there is 
a car registered in the name of Kochi Silamaj. Immediately they're suspicious. And what stands out about Silamaj's car is that vehicle had been in Eastbourne, in that area of Eastbourne, for a full year prior to the murder. Yet on the night of the murder, it suddenly travelled to London for a four hour period, then travelled all the way back to Eastbourne. This was not typical behaviour of Selimage, and it sticks out like a sore thumb. But of course, it's not enough for the investigators to just see that this seems like atypical behaviour to this man's ordinary movements. The investigators need to prove that it was Selimage who had driven the vehicle. So police are able to obtain a mobile number for him. And at this point, they start looking at his phone records. And the phone records prove, on the night of that murder, the phone had made the same journey as the vehicle. So even though they couldn't directly see that it was him in the car because the number plate scanner wasn't working in the area, now, because of the phone records and the car and the connection with that individual, they can see this is him. And Selimaj is now the prime suspect in their investigation. Amazing work by the police there. You can see that they absolutely were not going to give up on this case. This poor woman had met her death in such a heinous way and there was no way they were going to let it go because this had the hallmarks absolutely of a serial killer. Not that the police would let it go anyway, but you can see that they knew that they were time limited because when somebody has acted to kill in this kind of way, They've broken a boundary of behavior potentially, or it's a continuation of that behavior, meaning that they could well be dealing with somebody who turns into a serial killer. Another interesting piece of information that I think gives us insight into the kind of predator that Selimaj is, is that following the murder, so after he's killed this poor girl, he speaks to his ex-partner, Yonella, on the phone. And she said, it's just beyond cold-blooded because of the fact that he sounded completely normal, he sounded lucid, literally nothing whatsoever that suggested that he committed this horrific crime. But there was one thing that stood out to her that said that something had changed because when she saw him next, he bought new shoes. And the reason that something that for many of us just seems like nothing, at the end of the day, I don't even know when people buy new shoes, but for her, it was unusual. She was really surprised by this because one of the behaviours that she had got used to with this man that she had once shared a life with was that he'd only ever change his shoes when they were broken and when they weren't wearable anymore. And she knew that the ones that he had been wearing seemed fine. So that was something that she felt was out of character. At this point, we know that poor Sabina's family are having to deal with the loss of their beloved child. And the community at large is devastated. Hundreds of people, hundreds. They all join this candlelit vigil near the park where she was killed. And Sabina's sister, who was one of her best friends, Jabina, she addressed the crowd and she said, she said, words cannot describe how we are feeling. This feels like we are stuck in a bad dream and can't get out. Our world is shattered. We're simply lost for words. No family should go through what we are going through. And I think we can all empathise with those sentiments and those feelings. Mm -hmm. How can you ever come to terms or accept that these kind of things play out, let alone affecting your family? I mean, it's terrifying reading about it on the news, watching it in shows, but when it actually comes out that it's your family, member that is no longer coming home because they have been a victim of this kind of heinous assault and murder. It's impossible to wrap your head around how that would feel. At 3 a.m., this is a Sunday, September 26, 2021, police arrest Salamaj. He's at home at the time, you know, he's in the flat behind the row of shops and takeaways in Eastbourne and chillingly, when they arrive, he's just calm really calm and collected when he's taken into custody. I don't know about you guys, but if the police turned up at my gaff and were like, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder, 
I would be firstly very angry and confused because it definitely wasn't me. And secondly, I would be asking like a million questions and I'd be trying to meet my mum and asking her to come. I would be doing all of these things because I'm an innocent person and I'm going to freak out that the police are even at my door, let alone bundling me into a car, arresting me with suspicion of murder. That is how a normal, innocent human would act. He doesn't act that way. It's almost like he's expecting it to some degree. Then the investigators search his property and instantly they find that footwear that Salamad had been wearing on the night he killed Sabina. Now, isn't that intriguing? This guy who has up until now been forensically relatively sophisticated has literally kept the shoes that he was wearing the night that he killed Sabina. You kind of feel like even though he is somebody who recognises that could cause him issues in the future, i.e. links him to the crime. He's such a skinflint and he doesn't like replacing his shoes when they don't need sorting out that he's holding them back, wearing the other shoes until in the future he feels safe enough to wear the ones that he's kept because they were involved in the crime on that night, but he thinks that over a period of time it will become less of a problem for him. You can't help but believe that, because why wouldn't he have simply dumped them? He's gone out and bought a pair of shoes. So as much as he thinks he's forensically clever, obviously his desire to be thrifty overwhelms him and prevents him from actually getting rid of the evidence. And the trainers are really obvious as far as being able to see that they link to the crime because they've got this really thick white sole and when they examine the soles, forensics were able to see that there were spots of blood on them. They also found a DNA match for Sabina and also they actually found clothing matching that worn by the guy in the CCTV on the night of the murder. So basically it's a house full of evidence directly linking this man to the scene of the crime. Later, they even actually were able to recover the murder weapon which Selamaj had dumped in the river. So they were able to at this point know that they had the right guy banged to rights, simple as. They take him in for questioning and Selamaj is just an arrogant type of human being. So he largely refuses to grace the police with any answers and just replies no comment. Which we all know, if somebody says no comment, it means massively guilty. Probably just should put me in prison now for life because firstly, I'm non-compliant and that's annoying when you're dealing with this kind of crime. And secondly, if I don't feel that I need to answer the questions because I haven't got something to say that won't incriminate me, it's because I'm guilty as hell genuinely feel like anybody who uses the no comment claim should just be instantly told that they're going to get the longest sentence for that crime. Just saying. It's just my point of view. I'm not saying that it's going to happen. Just saying if I ran the world, it would. Anyway, all he actually managed to say during this interview was that he wasn't the one responsible for Sabina's murder. I find that massively frustrating. Because again, I'd be like, are you saying you were not responsible for this heinous murder? It wasn't me. May I draw your attention to your shoes in your house with her blood in it? They're not mine. They're in your house. And also while we're at it, so is the outfit that the guy on CCTV was wearing when he carried out the crime. No comment. I'm sorry. We're going to have to take you to the dungeons. The dungeons. We have a new rule and McKenny made it up. If you don't tell the truth when you're being interviewed by trying to use the no comment rule, instantly you get life in the dungeons. Not even prison. Anyway, he just goes with this whole idea that he didn't do it. Now at one point, of course at this point, is speaking to detectives through an interpreter because his English isn't good enough to be interviewed in a way that would make sense for him to have a fair questioning. He suddenly asks through this interpreter, what will happen if I open up now and say everything? Sadly, in spite of the fact that you would want 
him to be able to just go ahead and say whatever it was that he needed to say and confess, ideally. The police were not able to probe him further at that moment because he hadn't been officially charged, even though the evidence was overwhelming against him. At that point, he hadn't been charged. As the case progressed, it's like he has time to think and rethink. So the admission of, shall we say, guilt, because clearly he was making it obvious in that moment, wasn't he, that there was something to tell the police. Well, it starts to change. Of course it does. So on the 30th of September 2021, this is at a preliminary hearing, Selimaj pleads not guilty to the murder charge. By the way, at this point, he had actually accepted that he had struck Sabina and rendered her unconscious. Yeah. So by this point, at the preliminary hearing, he has been like, yeah, I did actually render her unconscious by hitting her with this weapon that I used. But I'm not guilty of murder really don't know where he was going with this idea. But again, should any of us be able to fight a case as the prosecution, these are the kind of cases one would wish to fight because we could pick holes hugely in the whole circumstances surrounding this murder and also what he's trying to play out as the story of events that unfolded with somehow him not being guilty for this poor girl's murder. Then we get to the 27th of January, 2022. Selimaj by this point has now confirmed that yes, he was actually the attacker, but he claimed that he didn't remove any of Sabina's clothing. He says he didn't raise her dress, he didn't leave her sexually exposed. Also, he decides that he's gonna suggest that even though he kills her, it wasn't sexually motivated. So, you know, he admits to the fact that he violently attacks this poor defenseless woman after loitering around a park, clearly waiting for a victim, kills her essentially, dumps her body, but then doesn't do any of the rest of it. As if some pervert was just, you know, wandering around the area, oh, just coming across a body, just finding a body on the floor and then posing it in that situation how he believes that anyone is going to buy this i have got no idea but it is despicable that he is putting sabina's family through this absolutely despicable gets to the 14th of february 2022 at this point oh well selimaj has decided that he would plead guilty to murder when it came to the next hearing so again we've gone from it wasn't me to it was kind of me to, it was me, but I didn't do that to, okay, I did do it. He's put Sabina's family through all of this. Honestly, I really think that my dungeon suggestion is actually one that should be deeply considered by parliament. They have a tower as well, don't they? There's a tower in the UK, the Tower of London. Leave him in there, whatever. Just how people are allowed to get away with the taunting of these families who have already gone through such agony, it's blindsiding, isn't it? That he's so without compassion, so without remorse, that he can literally put that poor family through all of his lies. Ultimately, he had nowhere to go. It was obvious that he would be found guilty, whichever way you look at this, but he was willing to draw this out. 25th of February, 2022. So it's really recent, it happened this year that he went to the Old Bailey and he did plead guilty to Sabina's murder. It's at this point he admits for the first time in court that the murder was indeed sexually motivated. And that admission, he wouldn't have realized at the time, I doubt. I don't believe he would have said it if he'd realised the impact, but that becomes a highly aggravating factor when it comes to sentencing, because that means that one, there was premeditation, and secondly, he was thinking about what he could do with that poor girl before he murdered her. So it's not just premeditated, it's an aggravating factor that he wants to sexually harm her before killing her or after killing her, it's irrelevant. There is a sexual motive, that's what's aggravating in this crime. 
He does, however, in spite of the fact that he admits this, fail to provide any further details about his motivation. He just says he did it and he said nothing else. And how else was he going to deal with this case? I mean, it was obvious that he did it. It would have all been brought out in court if he'd said he was not guilty. And I imagine that he would have had to confront and face far more gruesome details that he would have been questioned over and been made to look even more of a predator and liar than he manages to in all of this circus of lying and changing details and making the family go through this. I think he did it so that he saved himself having to go through all of the issues of a prosecution that we would have expected in this kind of case had he pretended that he wasn't involved or wasn't as involved as we all know that he was gets to the 8th of April, 2022. And at this point, Mr. Justice Sweeney has to sentence Selimaj for Sabina's brutal murder. Selimaj refused to attend court for the sentencing. He refused to attend court for the sentencing and also he refused to face, therefore, his victim's family. Genuinely, I don't know how this was allowed. He didn't even appear via video link. I can call him a coward because he's clearly a coward. But again, and you know me, I try to be balanced, but at the end of the day, our justice system should not allow a murderer like Selimaj to make a decision that he is not willing to face his victim's family or to be in court for the sentencing. If you're saying you're not going and you're a prisoner, let me tell you, mate, you're coming. And if I have to use a cattle prod and threaten you with a taser, you're going to sit in court and you're going to listen to those victim impact statements. That's it. End of. But he doesn't. He gets away with not going. One thing that is striking, however, is that Selimaj's father and sister, they travelled all the way from Albania for the hearing. They were absolutely stunned. They couldn't believe that he'd carried out the crimes. They were in absolute disbelief. And often we talk about families and we'll talk about situations and cases where family members are not supportive and you kind of look at the history of an individual and think, oh, well, even though they turned out to be this horrific human being, you can kind of see the chinks in the armour, the foundations that were broken, the problems in their childhood. That's not the case. This situation plays out where his own father and sister have the good conscience and compassion to come all the way from Albania because firstly they can't believe it but secondly I imagine they're showing a mark of respect they're actually being present for the sentencing which is a little bit mind-blowing when you imagine that he wasn't present. Selimaj faced the mandatory life sentence for murder but they have to establish what the minimum term is going to be before he becomes eligible for parole. Judge then has to look at all the various aggravating factors, there were quite a lot, let's be honest. Extensive premeditation. He had thoroughly planned this attack. He'd purchased the murder weapon beforehand. That was initially the rolling pin. And even though ultimately he used the emergency triangle, he'd only done that because it would be more suitable. That's a lot of premeditation. They had him driving around on CCTV. He was looking for a victim. Then they saw him loitering in Cater Park again, looking for a victim and he's armed at this point with the weapon. As soon as he's carried out the murder, he's wiping down the bench. He's got wet wipes. He already had those on him for that purpose. Also, another aggravating factor is that he had a history of violence towards his estranged wife. That's gonna be a further aggravating factor. He had put her in physically abusive situations. He'd made her fear for her life on numerous occasions. And of course, when you just think about the nature of the attack full stop, that made the crime even more serious. Sabina had been a completely vulnerable victim. She was a young, unsuspecting woman on her own. Also, the fact that this killing really increased concern for public safety, especially among young women. 
this killing had actually occurred only six months after the absolutely shocking murder of Sarah Everard by off-duty police officer Wayne Cousins. If you haven't watched my video on that, it's well worth going and watching it. Because again, in that particular case, wow, so many failures that occurred. But again, we'll know that the police did everything they could to bring that individual to justice, same as in this case. So that was an aggravating factor because now the whole community is terrified about the possibilities of just going out at night and walking through parks and feeling safe in their home environment. Another aggravating factor was that he concealed Sabina's body because delaying the discovery of a body clearly adds to the mental anguish of, in this case, Sabina's family and friends. And again, it shows cunning, calculation, distorting reality to try to protect the self, putting distance between him and the crime. And all the while, that means that Sabina's family and friends are in horrific anguish. And that's a highly aggravating factor. When it comes to mitigation, the judge did take certain things into account. So he took into account the lack of previous convictions. They also took into account his early guilty plea. I don't think that should have been taken into account. Genuinely, I think you either plead guilty or not guilty at the point that you realize that you've been charged. If you go not guilty and you're guilty, I think that if it gets close to the case and then you're like, oh, maybe I did do it. At that point, throw the book at them. Seriously, you shouldn't get any reductions or mitigation for any early guilty plea unless it is right at the beginning where you're like, bang to rights, I did it, I'm sorry. At that point, we can think maybe there is a semblance of conscience there, who knows, with some restoration or reparation and a lengthy sentence in prison, this person may be rehabilitated. But they look at the fact that he hadn't had these convictions and he'd got this early guilty plea, but the clean record that was actually counterbalanced by his own admission that he'd previously assaulted his estranged wife. Also, fortunately, the judge was a little bit like I am and was like, well, you didn't actually give me your guilty plea at the very beginning. You didn't give me at my first opportunity to be given it. He'd waited five months before he'd changed his plea to guilty. Now you may think, okay, well, at least he did plead guilty, Emma. At least that indicates that maybe there was a shred of remorse, maybe a morsel of conscience. You know, maybe he just wished not to put Sabina's friends and family through the trauma of the trial. But that's not the case. In fact, Selimaj had made it abundantly clear to the court through his counsel, and I mean, he had made it clear through his counsel. So he wanted it to be noted that he had absolutely no remorse whatsoever for what he had done. Yeah. So his own barrister, Lewis Power QC, said that he had spent months representing a man who had failed to engage or give any explanation for what he had done. He said of his client, he has shown no remorse he is as cold as ice. And that's the barrister defending Selimage. Like I said, dungeons. Ultimately, Selimage got sentenced to a relatively hefty term. He got a minimum term of 36 years. Some of you, like me, may well believe that he should have just been given a full life tariff. Can we ever imagine that this kind of a human being is ever going to be able to walk the streets and not have women at risk? He'll be 72 years of age by the time he becomes eligible for parole. Maybe he'll have a hard time in prison and maybe not make it to that age. Who knows? In a victim impact statement, Sabina's sister, Jabina, stated this. She had a right to be walking down the path and enjoying herself. She had the right to feel safe, I would do anything to hold her one more time. When you listen to those kind of statements, they're really moving because you can hear clearly the anger that she feels, the justice to some degree that she was denied and the fact that she lost her sister, but also the confusion. And of course, finally, 
the loss and emotion, the wanting to hold her sister one more time. Because we never know when that last moment is. I cover these cases so often and that's what always resounds within my mind. The fact that we don't know it's our last goodbye. We don't know it's the last moment that will touch that human being that we love with all our heart, with all our soul. We don't think about the final words that we speak because we always think there's going to be another moment to experience the company. And her expressing that feeling of never being able to hold her again, it's such a present feeling that I experience when I talk about these cases. Sabina's parents, they stated this, the moment the police officer came to our house and told us she was found dead, our world shattered into pieces. How could you do such a thing to an innocent girl walking by, minding her own business? You are not a human being. You're an animal. I mean, I'd go further. I don't think he's an animal either because animals tend to treat one another better than that, as far as I'm concerned. I think there is something deeply inhuman, stroke, demon-like in humans like Silamage. They're an excuse for a human being. They don't know compassion. They don't know love. They don't know warmth. People like Selimaj just exist in some kind of vacuum of evil inhabiting the human form. What's even scarier about this case is that he wasn't even on the police radar. He didn't have any previous convictions in the UK. They looked at his convictions in Albania, non-existent, completely clean record. Then out of nowhere, he just brutally kills a complete stranger. The Metropolitan Police Detective Chief Inspector Neil John stated this, it is highly unusual for someone to go from zero to a crime of this magnitude. We are pleased Selimaj will spend the majority of his life in prison. Selimaj is a dangerous and violent offender who has never shown any remorse for his heinous actions. I mean, isn't it terrifying to imagine this human being, this crime I've just described to you, he's never given a shred of concern over what he's done to Sabina's family over what he did to that poor young woman that night. Sabina's death, it reignited the fury about violence towards women in the UK. You know, think about it. This murder took place in a public park. It was at a time when lots of people were out jogging, there were dog walking, there's loads of people around. When I looked at a website, and this website is called Counting Dead Women, it sounds very macabre, but it's really important because it helps us get insight into the amount of women who are being killed in the UK. So in 2021, at least 24 women in London were killed by a man. Across the UK, at least 141 women were killed by a man or where a man was at least the principal suspect. Having said that, guys, before you're like, what is Emma doing to us? What is Emma saying about us? I'm not. Listen, we all have to keep a really clear perspective when it comes to these kind of statistics because not every man is a rapist and a killer just waiting for the opportunity to strike. In fact, 99.9% .9 of men would not dream of being violent towards anyone. In fact, they would do the opposite. They would be protective. And the vast majority of men, even those who have tempers and may even at times be violent, still draw a line when it comes down to being violent towards a woman. But having noted that, again, it's really important that we hear this information and we know how to keep ourselves safe. Now, this isn't for one minute me trying to blame any victim. People should be able to walk wherever they want, wear whatever they want, do whatever they want, be who they are freely, free from harm without a doubt, but we don't live in a world like that. So it's really important that we listen to the advice that we're being given about making sure that we try to make ourselves as safe as possible. Like I said, we should be able to do whatever we want, but unfortunately there are predators like this who live in the shadows. 
and to protect ourselves, we need to think sometimes about ways, even things like walking through the park with your keys in your hand, with the key down so that if anybody comes to strike, you can attack them back. Even though you don't want to have to think like that, sometimes it can be helpful. And also the gut instinct, the listening to that. If you don't want to walk through that park because it makes you feel eerie or scary, don't do it. If you don't want to walk that way home because you just have that feeling that something isn't quite right, get a cab. Do whatever it takes. Be over sensitive to that instinct because at least that means that whilst it might cost you a little bit more money or it might mean that you don't walk that way and you take a longer route, that you inherently connected with that protective mechanism within you. Don't let other people tell you you're silly for feeling that way. I'm just wanting to acknowledge the reality of the fact that Sabina should never have been a victim and she could do nothing about that, don't get me wrong, but that we have to learn the lessons from these incidents. There will always be violent individuals who just have no value for human life. So what we have to do is we have to reduce our risk of harm in any way we can. Absolutely, like I said, it is not our faults when we become victims. It is absolutely the perpetrator who is in the wrong. But what we don't want is people ending up in situations where those predators get to do what they want to innocent human beings like you or I, because we ignored some basic instincts that resounded within us. Sabina should have been able to walk through that park every single day, whether it was 8.30 in the evening, 3.30 in the morning, it doesn't matter. She had a right. And that excuse for a human being, he stole that right from her. And now her family have to live with the consequences. Even though some of you will have heard of this case, I would imagine that quite a lot of you haven't because like I said, COVID was happening and Sarah Everard's murder had happened six months earlier. And even though it did get press, I don't feel it got the volume and amplification that Sabina deserved. She was an incredible human being. She was an adored human being. She was a pro-social individual making a difference to children's lives in her community. Her future was going to be great and it was denied by this monster. So I wanted to cover this case, like I said, to give her visibility because she absolutely deserved it for all the right reasons as well as for the fact that she lost her life in this horrible way. I hope he never gets out. I hope he rots away in jail because people who show no remorse, people who are predators like Salamaj, they're never gonna be safe to walk our streets. And when they are on our streets, no woman will ever be safe around them. Thanks for joining me. Let me know what you think of this case. Leave me a comment. If you found it interesting, please give me a like. Subscribe if this is the kind of content that you wanna see regularly. I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday every single week. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate you massively. See you again next time for True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. No!